just as a little note, if you have logged in and you see that your own name says Joel Clinton instead of your name, feel free to rename yourself and identify yourself with who you are so that um, we also know this for the participants list. Um, with that, I will let um, Ria do the formal introduction and she will be moderating with uh, I'm really, really happy to introduce Ria. Ria, many of you probably already know Ria Lobo. She is uh, well known in the TV community. She's an excellent communicator. She leads many activities on behalf of TV survivors as a TV survivor herself, started Didi Lobo, has made beautiful films. Um, and I love how active she is in the union conference and the Stop to Be partnership and is a wonderful moderator. So I'm really, really pleased to have her uh, kick off this meeting uh, with a few words and moderate the first hour um, of this uh, workshop. So Ria, please take the floor over from me and uh, it's it's all up to you now. Thanks, thanks so much Petra and, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm actually really excited about this talk because um, it's something I understand very well because um, growing up uh, a good part of my life in India, uh, I've seen how we are so dependent on the neighborhood pharmacy and, you know, we just walk across and, you know, he's a friend most of the time and he knows as well uh, for many, many years and he means well, or he or she, and um, it, it's just, I think um, it's really, really important and I cannot stress how important it is to have a TB services uh, very easily accessible, you know, around the locality. And, and, and I think um, the person people trust the most is really the pharmacist. And I think he has a huge, he or she has a huge responsibility on uh, their shoulders. And, and I think this is, uh, this is a really exciting workshop uh, that we have today. Um, the pharmacist also has a really, really important role in TB prevention and care, and, uh, and also has the and, and, I, and I also know for a fact that um, being engaged with pharmacies um, is really, really important to tackle antimicrobial resistance as well, especially in a country like India, where, you know, um, antibiotics are sold pretty freely. And, um, and I think, I think um, this is a really, really important discussion to have. I'm very, very excited today to introduce uh, our first speaker who is going to be giving opening remarks. And her name is Hannah Monica Dyes. Uh, she is an exemplary human being um, and an exemplary professional uh, who I have, have the ple pleasure of knowing, calling my friend. Um, Anna Monica Dias leads the work at the World Health Organization's Global TB Program. Um, she also leads work at the WHO flagship initiative Find, Treat, All, and TB and the Public Private Mix. So she has a lot of responsibility in her hands, as you can see, and uh, she has been with the WHO for over 14 years and has a lot of experience in strategy and policy development, as well as building partnerships, strengthening multi-sectorial collaboration and advocacy. Prior to joining the WHO, she worked at the International Trade Center in Geneva on HIV and trade issues, as well as a, at a private nonprofit hospital in India. I think she has a whole lot of experience and would be the best person to, to open this workshop. Hannah, over to you. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Ria, and greetings to your colleagues. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to join all of you to discuss this important uh, topic. I'm pleased to, um, yeah, to welcome you with uh, Ria, Madhu, Petra, and speakers. It's quite a distinguished lineup of speakers today, powerful experts from countries and partners. So um, to kick off this discussion, just to re reiterate, um, you know, again, to bring in front of us some of the data that we have around the burden of uh, the TB epidemic. Um, as all of you know, it still remains one of the top infectious killers in the world. It's the second top infectious um, killer after, after COVID-19. And um, as you may have heard in several meetings and, you know, learning network sessions as well, COVID-19 has really, you know, kind of um, pushed us back by several years, the progress back by several years, we were seeing uh, public-private mix efforts push up, um, you know, efforts to reach everybody with uh, prevention and care, but there's been a big setback uh, to progress. And now really the focus is to get back on track. 
huge gaps remain in access to prevention and care, especially for care. Um, the gap has widened to 4.1 million people who miss out on access um, to TB care. This is up from 2.9 million in 2019. And as you are aware, closing these gaps will require engagement of all care providers. This is what we uh, do on public-private mix as WHO, as the Stop TV PPM Working Group, the TV PPM Learning Network. This is really our focus. And as Ria very eloquently mentioned, um, you know, pharmacies are one of those important stakeholders. Unfortunately, um, they have. Unfortunately, though they have a vital role to play, um, these are one of the care providers that are not very well engaged. Their, their real potential hasn't been fully tapped. Um, they are uh, the first point of care for a large proportion of um, individuals with TB symptoms who, um, you know, who, uh, yeah, who who go to seek care. Um, they have long um, hours of operation, they're less queues. As Ria said again, they are, you know, your neighbor, neighbor, friendly neighborhood, you know, pharmacist, someone you can go and talk to you've known for years, um, seek advice. And of course, there's this issue that um, many studies show that um, unfortunately, pharmacy providers dispense cough medicines, um, bronchodilators, antibiotics over the counter rather than refer patients. This is, um, this is a gap which can delay diagnosis and care. Um, also disbursement of um, antibiotics in an irrational manner can lead to drug resistance. So AMR, antimicrobial resistance is a big issue. So yeah, so lots of different aspects um, that we need to look at today um, in today's workshop. It's really important, um, this discussion for us today to discuss what are the success story, what's worked, what hasn't, what are the challenges, what are the practical steps that we can take, what are the additional tools um, that we need. We've kind of documented a little bit, but um, there's we still need to further develop um, you know, the tools to take this, uh, to really um, strengthen implementation, um, collaboration, or, you know, working with pharmacies. So really looking forward um, to the discussions today. We hope that um, the actions, um, the suggestions that emerge from it can really contribute uh, to the tools that we are developing um, as, um, as the working group, as WHO, as the learning network. Um, as part of the second version of the PPM roadmap that we plan to uh, launch this year or next. So we really are looking for your practical advice, your support, and together we can make a difference. So I'll stop there, but really excited and um, look forward to this discussion. Thanks so much, Monica. As, as you were speaking, I actually recalled a little conversation I had once uh, in a taxi in Mumbai where the taxi driver um, was telling me that his daughter has been coughing for three months and uh, the, the pharmacist has been giving different cough medicines, you know, uh, to, tack, to take care of this cough. And I told him, you know, you should really go see a doctor and check if it's TB. And he's never heard of the, he didn't even know what TB was or he's never heard of the, uh, the, the idea of, you know, he thought that, okay, we're just gonna just use every cough medicine in the in the book and and I trust my pharmacy more than I trust you or my doctor and for a lot of people they look at the pharmacist as an easy point of access right um, and rather than waiting in a long uh, queue so I, I really really resonated with what you said Monica thank you very much for for your opening thoughts um, the purpose of this webinar really is to learn from each other and learn from all the countries and what they're up to and you know um because something that's happening in nigeria can benefit something that's happening in india you know i mean of course cultural contexts are different but um there's a lot we can learn from from each other and on that thought i'm really really excited uh, to introduce our next speaker who is going to talk about pharmacy engagement in nigeria her name is Bol bolanli i hope i said that right bolanli Please correct me if I didn't. Uh, she is currently the technical director for public-private mix initiative for the USAID TB Lawn project. Uh, just give me a moment. TB Lawn 3 project being implemented by IHVN in Nigeria. 
She also served as the tuberculosis technical director and later on as the chief of party for the Shops Plus project implemented by APT Associates in Nigeria. She joined APT Associates from KNCV in Lagos, where she worked as PMDT technical advisor. She has over 16 years experience in the field of public health, including leading the clinical and programmatic management of drug resistant tuberculosis in USAID supported states in Southwest Nigeria, and the planning and implementation and evaluation of TBHIV, MDR-TB, and community TB care programs. Bol Bolanli's other competencies include pro program management, capacity building, stakeholder engagement, and advocacy. She holds a Bachelor of Medicine and a Bachelor of Surgery degree from the University of Lauren, and a, MPhil, a, a, a Masters of Public Health from the University of Lagos. Thank you so much for joining us today, Bolanli, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, hello, everyone. I'll just take the next few minutes to talk about a very important part of our work um, in the private sector engagement in Nigeria. Um, an aspect of the work that was um, initially underrated uh, until we came to got to know how important that um, sector of the private sector is to our work. Next slide, please. So we do know that um, globally, Nigeria ranks sixth among the high TB burden countries um, in the world and um, first in Africa. In 2021, our TB case notification increased significantly to over 200,000. I mean, just in the previous year, we're still at about 138,000 TB cases notified. And now we have over 207,000 TB cases notified in 2021. And consequently, our case detection rates increased to 45% from about 30% um, in the previous year. Interestingly, public-private mix implementation accounted for about 28% of the total TB notifications. Um, and it is not um, a secret anymore in Nigeria that the private sector engagement contributed significantly to this increase. As a matter of fact, um, in 2020, when our case finding increased by 18,000 TB cases, the private sector notifications also increased by exactly 18,000 TB cases. So you can see a direct relationship between increasing TB notifications in Nigeria and increasing TB case detection from the private sector. Unfortunately, um, less than one third of the private providers has engaged for TB services in Nigeria. So even with all the accomplishments, we know the potential is enormous and we still have a lot of work to do in engaging more private providers. Um, so it's not a surprise that we still have a gap of our 55% in TB case notification in Nigeria in spite of the increase in 2021. Next slide. We have come to realize the important role of the private sector and specifically the drug, um, the retail drug um, outlets in Nigeria. As far back as 2012, when the National TB Prevalence Survey was done in Nigeria, about 46% of patients who had symptoms of TB, notably cough, said they had sought care, you know, somewhere. And about 43% of them, after interviewing them, actually sought care in the private sector. But what we saw was that out of that 43%, more than half of them actually went to the PPMVs or the chemists or the pharmacies. We use those terms interchangeably sometimes when you are not really um, particular about knowing exactly where the patient went to. But from this slide, we can see that about 28% of the 43% who went to the private sector actually did so by going to a um, retail drug outlet. Only 11% went to a hospital and even less went to a mission hospital. So we can see that when we say that over 60% of health service delivery in Nigeria is through the private sector, we actually are referring in a lot of instances to the retail um, drug outlets. They actually are part of the private sector, though informal, but they actually contribute a lot to the um, healthcare delivery um, through the private sector in Nigeria. Next slide. On this slide, I've tried to classify um, the retail drug outlets into formal and informal. 
So the formal drug outlets are those that are certified, licensed to actually sell all kinds of medicines, including prescription medicines. And in Nigeria, they are majorly community pharmacies. They're only, the only ones that are really licensed to sell um, prescription medicines. But they are fewer in number. They are just above 6,000 all over the country that are registered um, you know, with the association. And um, their presence is actually limited to only urban areas. And when we are engaging private providers, this is a major limitation. The further you go in the interlands, the less from, of um, the pharmacies that you see, and then you'll see more of the informal um, drug outlets. The pharmacies in Nigeria are, are regulated by the Pharmaceutical Council of Nigeria, PCN, and they also have a professional association called ACPN, Association of Community Pharmacists of Nigeria. And we work with both bodies, both for regulation and to enforce regulations, and also as for oversight and collaboration in private sector engagement. Now, the informal drug outlets, most of them we, that are recognized are called patent and proprietary medicine vendors in Nigeria, the PPMVs. We also call them other names. Um, when we want to present on international fora like this, we know PPMVs may not be well known. So sometimes we call them drug shops, sometimes we call them medicine stores, or we even call them chemists colloquially, even in Nigeria. They are more numerous than the former private sector of former drug retailers, they number over 62,000 registered PPMVs. And they are more abundant um, in the northern part of Nigeria. And these are just registered ones. We have a lot more that are not registered with the association or the regulatory bodies. They are also regulated by the Pharmaceutical Council of Nigeria, who provides all the regulations that um, track and monitor their practices. They have their own professional body called NAPMED, and we found them to be very important and pivotal in private sector engagement in Nigeria. They are everywhere. They are very accessible to the people. They are found in slums, in villages, in rural areas, in urban areas, and even in marketplaces. And we also have a lot of them that are not registered PPMVs, and they just peddle drugs, like the image um, on the slide shows. They are drug sellers, drug hawkers, um, village drug peddlers. They go to villages sometimes on market days, and they go um, to places where nobody else goes. They are the doctors in quotes in some of these communities. And the community members look up to them, look up to when they will come, you know, always expecting them to come and help them solve their health challenges. So we do realize that our PPNVs are just a part of the informal private sector. We know that we still have a long way to go in engaging these drug sellers and hawkers and peddlers that serve as doctors in many rural communities in Nigeria. Next slide, please. On this slide, I've tried to um, give a brief overview of what the engagement has been like um, in Nigeria over the a few, um, past few years. So across all programs, CPs and PPMVs have been traditionally engaged to identify and refer presumptive TB patients in the up and spoke model that the image on the top um, part of the left part of the screen. Um, but only a fraction of the PPMVs and CPs have been engaged as we can expect. I mean, we have over 6,000 CPs and in subsequent slides, you'll be seeing how many we have um, engaged across all the different projects and programs that have been done in Nigeria. PPMVs are also um, so numerous that we could only engage even less in terms of proportion compared um, to the CPs. Effective engagement is mostly through the associations. We have learned um, over the years that we needed to engage the associations, NAPMED and ACPN to have a good entry into this um, professional group. Um, we've learned more. Initially, we're focused on just teaching them and training them to, to screen everyone that comes to their pharmacies, identify whoever has um, symptoms of TB, especially cough, and refer the patients to the clinical or the hospital um, facilities. But then we found that, that we're losing patients before diagnosis. So we went a step further and trained them on infection control and how to collect sputum um, specimen. And our case finding increased significantly after we've done this across different programs. So now they are trained to screen, to identify presumptives, and even to collect sputum specimen and refer the specimens rather than the patients to the hospitals and laboratories. A mystery client survey was done um, by um, the Shots Plus program then using USID resources, and we found evidences, um, data to support the fact that PPMVs are effective in linking TB patients 
to high quality care in their communities. But we have challenges which we'll do it on later in a future slide. The hub and spoke model is not perfect. We set out thinking, challenge the short plus program that we're going to have this perfect urban spoke model on the upper part of the image on the left. But then we don't have ended up having different models across different cities and states. So on the left, you see the model in Lagos, where you have more of hospitals and clinical facilities and fewer PPMVs. Not because they didn't exist, but because of their willingness to be engaged. On the right, you have more of PPMVs in Kano, that's Northern Nigeria. And as a matter of fact, these two um, pictorial depictions have has been the, um, the trend in Nigeria right now. In the Northern part of the country, you have most cases of TB through the private sector coming from the informal private sector, the PPMVs, and some from community pharmacists. While in the Southern part of the country, like Lagos, you have most of the cases come from, from the private hospitals. This is what we have seen to be true, that our urban spoke model is not perfect. And um, we should expect to see different variations across different cities. And um, we also have challenges with sputum collection and, bot um, you know, and bottlenecks in referral, which we're going to see um, in subsequent slides. Next slide, please. Um, I've, in the next few slides, I'll be showing the performance of different programs with different um, types of um, drug retail stores. So under Shops Plus, as previously explained, we, we could only engage a few um, CPs, more PPMs in terms of absolute numbers, but they represent a tiny fraction of the PPMs that exist in those states and communities. Then you'll see the differential case finding I was referring to. So the image on the upper part of the slide shows um, the blue bubbles um, are the clinical facilities. The green bubbles are patent medicine vendors. And you see that the community pharmacists hardly have any kids that they are supposed to be the red bubbles. So you see that in Lagos, you have mostly the blue bubbles from the clinical facilities, and then the green bubbles on the lower image are the PPMVs, case finding from PPMVs in Kano. Next slide. And in the Global Fund Program, what they saw mostly was an increase, increase in the yield from PPMVs and CPs over the years. On the right, you will see the, by, the pie chart showing that 56% of the cases in the Global Fund Program across 21 states in Nigeria are from the informal drug sellers. Next slide. This is long three. Um, this part of Shops Plus transited into long three um, in, four, in Lagos, and of course, long three also exists in three other states in Nigeria. And you will see the differential performance of different provider groups. I've tried to circle the performance of the PPMVs um, on the pie chart that shows you that they actually contribute significantly next to the hospitals across the states in the Southwest. Next slide. I devoted an entire slide to talk about the role of PPMVs majorly during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we saw a reduction in the footfalls um, in both hospitals and clinics um, due to access restriction and because patients didn't want to go to the hospitals for fear of being stigmatized to have COVID because of their cough symptoms. And because we're also afraid of getting infected with COVID. And so we saw a lot of patient tribute to the patent medicine sellers. And um, as a proactive program, SHOST was quickly adapted by deploying screeners that were supposed to be in the hospitals to the PPMV stores, like the image um, on the right. And what we saw was an increase in case finding in spite of COVID. This was replicated in many parts of the country, maybe not exactly in the same manner as the roaming screeners, but a lot of attention was given to the patent medicine vendors, the informal drug retail, and that contributed significantly to the increase Nigeria witnessed in TB case notification in 2020, in spite of COVID. Next slide. It's time to talk about the challenges that we've had, um, despite these successes and all, these, all, all our um, adaptations and innovations. We've consistently seen an apathy on the part of the community pharmacist. They have the lowest yield of all provider types across the private sector. And when we deep dived, what we found was that they were not very um, enthusiastic about the program because we're limiting them to only identify and refer presumptives. They argued that their role as professionals is to dispense medications. And as a program, we are now talking in Nigeria about going beyond TB screening and referral to making them treatment supporters by strengthening collaboration with the associations. As we speak, we've had meetings with ACPN about how to institutionalize treatment support. We may not be able to help them to get, to get them to initiate patients on treatment yet until the NCBLCP approves. But right now in the program, we have provisions to allow them to do treatment supporters for patients. 
And what more, we can actually even get them paid through the health insurance scheme. Um, we are talking with Lagos State Health Insurance Scheme on how to um, include pharmacists on their benefit package for TB. And they've already fixed it. They've, as we speak, there's a meeting going on in Lagos between the um, informal private sector and the health insurance scheme to see how they can benefit from the insurance scheme to pay them when they're able to um, dispense drugs as treatment supporters to patients. We've also seen um, our pharmacists and PPMV sometimes selling um, prescription medicines. The mystery client survey that was done in 2019 and again in 2021 showed this clearly. There was an improvement in 2021 after um, the program worked on the CPs and the PPMVs, but we saw more of these prescription medications being sold by the community pharmacists. Again, highlighting the fact that they need to be given more roles um, in terms of treatment supports beyond identifying and referring presumptives. We also see that PPMVs perform differently across states, as the example given for Kano and Lagos. And what we have learned is to optimize these provi different provider groups based on their strength in different locations and different states. Um, our PPMVs are very incentive driven, and this can be um, a challenge in terms of sustainability. So the program is now looking more towards um, giving non-financial incentives, giving awards, recognition plaques, I'm sending them to conferences and meetings as um, appreciation of their work. We've also seen bottlenecks as the mutual client survey showed us clearly that um, when it comes to screening, they screen that in five presumptives, but you will see that gap, that drop off between patients that make it to um, diagnosis and treatment. But then they still do a lot of work in that respect, but that gap exists and we, we are dealing with it. Attribution is problematic. In the national level in Nigeria, we only attribute notification to treatment. And because these providers don't treat, you will not see notification data being attributed to them at the national level. But each program can actually tell how many patients, CB patient diagnosed and treated came from the informal drug providers. So the, we are having conversation with national program on how to make our notification more towards diagnosis as time goes on. Next slide. Looking ahead, we've seen the need to step up the role of community pharmacists to treatment supports and drugs dispensing beyond identifying and referring. We've also seen the need to tie our PPMVs like PCN has done, to identify those who have health backgrounds and can offer treatment support. We've also learned um, that we can empanel our CPs and PPMVs on the health insurance scheme like in Lagos and get them paid you know, from health insurance, each patient are also registered to um, when they dispense drugs and health assessment supporters. And of course, we need to intensify capacity building. And as this image shows, even during COVID in the short stops program in Kano, we're able to have virtual trainees for PPMVs, but we need them to do more, not only to identify and diagnose patients for us, but also to act as treatment hubs where patients on TB treatment already before the lockdown could get their refills and they performed excellently well in this regard in Kano in Nigeria. And we are strengthening partnerships with ACPN um, using their, they have two platforms, one for training and one for capturing data. And we think if we speak their language and work more in sync with them, we might be able to solve the community pharmacist challenge in Nigeria and take our engagement um, to the next level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Bolandi. I found that very fascinating because uh, it's amazing how you have two different strategies for both the formal and the informal sector, uh, the drug um, sector. And I, and I, I think it's um, really commendable, the work you've done. So thank you for that. I hope we have time for questions afterwards. Um, uh, but just getting moving on to the next speaker, we, we just have uh, another half an hour left for this part of the workshop. Um, and we're moving to Asia uh, and to learn about pharmacy engagement in Pakistan. And to do that, I'm, I'm happy to introduce Ms. Kins al Uman, who is a chartered accountant and a project management professional who has been in public health programmatic management and research with a focus on tuberculosis control for the past 12 years. In addition to her ACCA from uh, England, she has two master's degrees from England and Italy. She is currently exploring the global health sphere and leading DOPASI, Foundation's programmatic interventions while acting as a secretariat lead for Stop TB Partnership Pakistan. 
and the recently established and very important NTB parliamentary, uh, parliamentary caucus in Pakistan. She is also leading a couple of research studies deploying Fujifilm FDR there for screening for tuberculosis and COVID-19, along with developing and evaluating various mobile applications for enhancing TB case notification through private sector, including pharmacies and mobile applications to support TB treatment. Welcome, Kins. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, so, am I uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Thank you. Oh, great. Uh, so, I'll be presenting our experiences from a project uh, pioneering a social enterprise model to notify TB patients through private pharmacies in Pakistan. Uh, this intervention was implemented by the Pasi Foundation, which is a Section 42 non for profit company registered with SECP. And uh, the intervention was supported by Stop TV Partnership under its TBDH initiative. And we implemented it in collaboration with the National Provincial TB Control Program. Uh, Pakistan has huge TB burden with around 580, now around six, 600,000 drug sensitive and around 28,000 drug resistant TB cases. And in believe we miss around 220 uh, cases. An ITVIA report back in 2018 unearthed the fact that around 168,000 TB cases, uh, fixed drug combination courses were being sold uh, in private pharmacies in Pakistan out of which 90,000 such cases were from one province that was Punjab, indicating that a high proportion of TB patients getting treatment were uh, TB patients who were, actually being, uh, who were actually being diagnosed somewhere and getting treatment, but were missed from pay case notification. Over 75% of these missing of the overall missing cases in Pakistan can actually be traced by harnessing patients securing TB drugs prescribed by private practitioners through private pharmacies. Accordingly, we developed this intervention that was aimed at optimized implementation of TB case notification laws catalyzed by regulated drug sale to identify and include 15,000 missing TB cases using an innovative social enterprise model with the support of a mobile application called ETB, developed for notification and follow-up TB, uh, follow of TB patients through pharmacies. Uh, we started with advocacy at the highest level. Uh, initially, when this report was presented uh, to the Ministry of Health, IQVIA report, the right away feedback from the Minister of Health at the time, Dr. Zafar Mirza, was that we should actually place a total ban on sale of uh, anti TBs over, uh, on the, in the private pharmacies. This was taken up by the leadership of the program and everyone, and uh, it was shared that if if something like this is done, it will be indeed a, a, a matter of a sort of human rights that will be violated if we uh, if we are unable if uh, because it will be sort of harming the excess of the patients, and then accordingly we sat with the we, we sat with all the private uh, manufacturing companies the uh, the companies that are manufacturing ATTs in Pakistan, we sat with them we had a consultation and we actually asked them that how can we uh, how can uh, we together come up with a solution in which uh, the sale on uh, keeps on going but the cases are sort of brought to the notification net at, uh, of the government of Pakistan are actually notifi notified to the national debut control program and accordingly this mobile application was developed and we had a huge uh, uh, discussion with all the various levels including the minister of Punjab the governor of Punjab and with the we had a uh, sort of a series of sessions with the NTB parliamentary caucus and uh, we uh, came up with this thing that an application will be developed that will be uh, sort of made available to all the private pharmacies and it will be mandated upon them 
to notify the case using the prescription of a person coming with a prescription of TB, uh, capturing a picture of that and notifying it through the mobile application. And uh, somewhere around January last year, the Minister of Health had a session with the media in which she made a notification on the, this application mandatory across the province of Punjab. Uh, then this was, uh, then obviously when we started implementing, there were a hell of a lot of challenges. The acceptance uh, from the pharmacies was very low and uh, we accordingly uh, took it up, developed partnerships with the, a lot of stakeholders, the primary and secondary department of health, the director general health office, the, uh, the chief uh, pharmacist, the pharmacy association, the private chemist association and all the associations and various that are involved in the drug part of it. Because initially we were seeing it uh, uh, coming from a background that our organization has been working in TB control for the last couple of decades. We were not that well versed when it came to the drug sector. So we developed a partnership with all the drug leadership uh, basically and then uh, th then the change sort of started to begin and after the news coming in the uh, in the uh, paper that it is mandatory and office orders being sent through the drug leadership the pharmacies actually started reporting this uh, in uh, this uh, sort of thing was uh, uh, sort of taken to the district level as well, in which we involved both the district health uh, authorities as well as the drug leadership. We have a setup in which there is a secret drug quality control board uh, under which there are around five to seven drug inspectors who normally uh, go to various pharmacies on a certain uh, at a certain duration and monitor the drugs that are the quality control substances which the pharmacies are mandated to keep record of. So through the District Health Administration and the District Drug Administration, we made it a part of their job descriptions to actually review how many, in, how many drugs that they have sold, how many they received from the distributor, how many they have sold, and whether they have report notified all the all the TV prescriptions that they sold in the ETB mobile app. And we provided them with an access of the dashboard to see which pharmacy has notified how many number of cases. Uh, there's a small video on the mobile application that I like to show. So the application had this possibility that uh, uh, any pharmacy can sign up using their uh, any pharmacy can sign up using their uh, license number, which we sort of kept as a as a tool to secure that uh, un, un uh, sort of uh, unauthorized access to the application is not allowed. So we uh, we uh, sort of out the background we had the license number from the government of Pakistan. So any pharmacy that has a license number can actually, all the pharmacy and chemist shop in Pakistan have a license number issued by the authorities. So they can sign up using their license number 
And whenever a patient with the prescription for anti-TB treatment comes to them, they want to, uh, they were to take a picture of the prescription, enter the name, contact number, uh, a name, contact number, and uh, the the medicines uh, along with the quantities that have been sort of dispensed to that particular person in the mobile application. And when the pharmacist become become sort of uh, well versed with the app, it used to take hardly around twenty to thirty seconds. The this the data that the pharmacist incorporated used to go to the central server. From the central server, it was uh, it was uh, linked to the call center. As soon as the call center used to get notification of a patient, it was verified and it was uh, sort of the patient received follow-up calls to collect any kind of missing information. And then on, uh, on sort of uh, following them up and sending different informative messages for continuing their treatment up to the, up to the whole duration. This data was eventually shared, for example, if certain uh, patients were not responding or if we were not seeing that their month to month, their, their purchasing medicine month to month from, from any pharmacy, then field officers used to visit them. And the data eventually at the end of a quarter was presented in the district meeting where line listing was done and any duplication was, uh, deduplication was done. And eventually the district TB coordinator reported it to the provincial program and from the provincial program, it, the data eventually went up to the national level. There was a broad based, uh, a broad -based uh, consortium of partners that were uh, sort of reviewing the performance throughout and uh, uh, and the project went so on and so forth. At the moment, uh, in the last four quarters till the end of the quarter one 2022, we have been able to notify around 15,669 cases through roughly 3,000 pharmacies. This is a snapshot from the dashboard taken uh, today, actually. And uh, this is the progress over the quarters. Uh, so our contribution over the quarters has been around 20 to 30 percent of the uh, 20 to 30 percent. There has been a 20 to 30 percent increase in the district case notification only through this project. And in the last IPM, it was presented that this uh, uh, that uh, this intervention alone actually contributed to the 15 percent of the overall provinces notification, which uh, is uh, the best uh, sort of performance of any other PPM intervention ever implemented in, in the country. Uh, as a way forward, thanks to Guy, who I just saw in the participant list as well, we, uh, we have been able to capture support from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the intervention is being scaled up under the data digitalization for public private mix Pakistan. This particular, uh, uh, the overall project is for the whole country and we're expecting that uh, this particular intervention is being scaled up at the moment in 58 districts. Uh, the uh, certain gaps that were identified through during the implementation like the quality care quality of care aspect and the linkage between the pharmacies and the gps so we'll be we'll be enhancing the applications feature to actually uh, link it with the gps and ensure quality of care aspect uh, brainstorming with the uh, common management unit uh, slash the national db control program is ongoing uh, for notification of these cases as a ppm file as a separate model under the ppm uh, with notified uh, through pharmacy so that the progress of this intervention can be tracked in the in the years to come this model so far has been proven to be extremely cost effective and uh, deliberations are underway with Stop TV partnership and the national leadership on conducting a, a cost effectiveness study uh, and comparing it uh, sort of with other active case finding or notification interventions. And other provinces are uh, other provinces other than Pakistan are also in the sort of intent of uh, replicating the same. And thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for listening. I'm will if there are any questions. Thanks, Kins. Uh, that was really interesting. I, I actually found it quite fascinating that uh, you know you began with this problem statement of the number of courses of TB medicines that were being sold in Pakistan and how those numbers just didn't match uh, notification rates. So glad to see the great work that the, the Pasi Foundation is doing uh, in tackling. Uh, this entire problem. Um, I have a bunch of questions. I hope we have time to address it. Uh, but before we do, uh, I would, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker who is also a 
if there was one crusader for TV elimination uh, in, in the world, uh, this guy is it. His name is Rakesh P.S. Uh, he's a medical doctor and a public health intervention specialist, currently serving as the senior technical advisor at the union's Southeast Asia office. He's one of the key persons who conceived and implemented STEPS, which is systematic system for TB elimination in private sector in India, which is a low cost sustainable system for ensuring standards of TB care to patients reaching the private sector. His technical support as a WHO consultant has resulted in a 50% reduction in TB incidents in the union territory of Lakshwadeep and 37.5% reduction in TB incidents in Kerala state over five years. He is also a Bernard Lawn Scholar at Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health in Boston, the USA. Before I just hand over the mic to Rakesh, uh, I'm really excited to see the sort of conversations that are going on in the chat. Would really encourage everyone to please put in your questions. Um, and, and I think the speakers can respond to them in the chat. We also have a, a really interesting R after Rakesh speaks where we have, um, we're going to be looking at common messages for pharmacists and that session will be moderated by Frank Wafula. So I would encourage everyone to please stay on and listen, for, listen to that as well. Rakesh, now over to you. Thank you, uh, Ria, for the wonderful words. Really happy to be here with all the Star Wars for fighting tuberculosis across the world. So I'm going to present a different perspective. Like we have listened to interesting stories from Nigeria and Pakistan. This is something like how a small state in India has actually engaged the pharmacies for a surveillance purpose. So basically as a background, like in India, all the drug sales, import, everything is being managed by a, a rule, drugs and cosmetics rules, 1945. But uh, there is a schedule H1. This is a regulation that has been brought in basically to uh, grab the antimicrobial resistance. Uh, that law mandates that the trucks could be sold by chemist only on production of a valid prescription by a modern medicine practitioner. The chemist also needs to maintain a separate register in which identity of the patient contact details of the prescribing doctor and other details need to be recorded. Like all the drugs in Schedule H1, there were a total of 46 drugs in Schedule H1. Uh, most of them were third and fourth generation cephalosporins, other antibiotics, but 11 of them were anti-tuberculosis drugs. So anti-tuberculosis drugs were included in Schedule H1 by Government of India as a uh, regulation where they need to maintain a register, maintain a record. All chemists need to maintain a record uh, of who, of each and every sale of the anti-TB drugs. So this is the background. Now I'm going to talking about a state in India, which is a Southern Indian state, it's called Kerala, where they have a specific TB elimination program and state has been certified recently by government of India and ICMR for uh, having a reduction of TB incidence by more than 40 percentage over the last six years. So there is a good involvement of the private hospitals through system for TB elimination in private sector. There is a separate program running there. Approximately the state has uh, mapped 15,000 private chemist outlets of its 650 stocked or sold anti-TB drugs in 2020. So this information is coming from the distributors, uh, the state manages through the drugs control mechanisms, like who are the distributors and which all pharmacies they are actually uh, stocking anti-tuberculosis drugs and selling anti-tuberculosis drugs. So this information is actually available. So, so in Government of India's National Strategic Plan, it was a clear plan to implement the Schedule H1 basically and engage the chemist to improve the surveillance purpose as such. The state, as a part of the TB elimination mission, has took that initiative. They advocated, uh, the advocacy was done by the TB program with the government officials. And it was a joint effort by the drug enforcement officers and national TB elimination program, the, the key staff in the state. 
they listed out all the chemists stocking or selling anti tb drugs i explained how they did that there was an intense sensitization and one to one education campaigns with the chemist so chemist association were also roped in there were a series of sensitizations that happened as group educations and individual visit joint visit by the drug enforcement department and the ntb officials and the major objective of each and every visit was sensitize the chemist on the need to maintain schedule h1 educate them on tuberculosis it was basically an education and sensitization visit that happened very periodically also so there were periodic reinforcements there was campaigns kind of stuff like a uh, two weeks campaign covering entire uh, chemist shops in in the in the state the joint visits along with the chemist shop representatives also there are chemist associations they also there was joint visits uh the information from schedule h1 register they were shared to ntp uh, officials basically uh, and there were review of activities joint review of activities with all the concerned departments and the stakeholders and follow up actions by the ntp Uh, so basically, this is how they started maintaining the Schedule H1 register, like with the with the name of the patient and which batch number, phone number, and who prescribed that drug. So there is no standardized format as such, but they they started maintaining all these kind of informations. And uh, what happened after that was like there was a felt need, like chemist also felt that maintaining too much of records may not be an easy task. But uh, fortunately, ninety percentage of the chemist. they were using computer generated bills there so they themselves it's it's the chemist uh, association and the chemist themselves they introduced their solution saying in their building software itself uh, they tried to uh, provide a mechanisms for uh, documenting the schedule h1 uh, drugs when they are selling so in the building software itself they introduced this concept this is purely uh, based on the demand and done by the chemist themselves so there were majorly seven building software companies and evolved it, it gradually evolved based on the felt need by the chemist uh, in doing that so initially like what we have seen in uh, pakistan experience also like initially uh, the, the the state tried to make the chemist notify this information but uh, they stopped that business because of three reasons basically one is basically it is very difficult to deduplicate because patients will buy drugs then the laboratory will also notify the patient the, the provider will also notify the patient so it was a bit difficult task to deduplicate the patient the same patient may buy medicines from different places one from particular district then go to other district it, it can also happen and the important thing is there are indications other than tb for which these drugs are also being prescribed for example like crohn's disease or some staphylococcus infections rheumatoid arthritis kind of stuff they start the some of the clinicians prescribe anti tuberculosis drugs and rifampicin uh, less than 5 percentage of them also for a zoonotic tuberculosis for example elephant if elephant had a tb uh, there was a practice of giving anti tuberculosis drugs to the elephant so like uh, i mean these are all informations which has came through uh, through this entire process i'm just trying to explain so we stopped the notification by the pharmacist was completely stopped but what has been done is this information has been used in for three different ways the important information it is basically like who prescribed this anti tuberculosis drugs so this column was the important informations which we focused on who prescribed this anti tuberculosis drugs and the system the national tuberculosis elimination program contacted those they are the right providers whom we need to target for engagement sensitizations or training them on standards of tb care kind of stuff so they identified the right providers based on the informations coming out from the pharmacies who prescribed these drugs so this is an important way which program used that information and helped them notify the second way is already government of india has a nikshai nikshai is a case based web based notification system so uh, they could actually cross verify it is a manual process done at the most decentralized level where the uh, the peripheral level worker will look at or even at the district level they will look at whether the patient which has been given by the chemist is there in the management information system or not if not again contact the provider contact the provider for getting that information is notified on the other way the information is coming through the systems were used for providing formal and informal feedbacks to the doctors through various organizations associations and all and there was a feeling of being surveilled basically 
So that has led to a self-standardization by the healthcare providers. So basically it has led to a strengthening of the TB surveillance system and also a quality improvement in TB drugs and treatment. I'm not going to details uh, of all these things and evidences, but uh, just one information. Like if you look at based on the scheduled H1 data, it is basically the NDP program managers who use this information to write friendly letters to doctors who did not notify uh, and offered them all support for notification. Now they started informing all these TB cases. In 2018, 18 TB cases were identified from scheduled H1, which were not in Nikshai. Uh, three doctors were who treated these 18 cases. We met those doctors sensitized them about the notification, offered them all support for notification. Last year, we got only two cases. I mean, these are some of the anecdotal evidences collected through the qualitative interviews. Um, I'm not going to the entire details, but generally through successful engagement kind of stuff, uh, the, the NDTB drug sales fall, that's on one side. But on the other side, the important thing that happened was like the unnotified estimated number of patients per under the one lakh population. 100,000 population based on the drug sales. That started falling down uh, drastically. I'm sorry, I couldn't update 2020 and 2021. This information is also available. It's 2.1 per lakh population. So that means there is, there is literally no cases that are actually initiated on treatment, but missing from the surveillance system now in that particular state that has been endorsed by government of India through their subnational certification process also. So we could bridge that gap as such. Uh, again, as a quality improvement process of this entire surveillance, one example, that after that I will stop the presentations. We have observed a sudden cluster of cases in an area through scheduled H1 register. When we investigated, all those were prescribed by a single pediatrician who settled in our area. We met him, we sensitized them about the diagnostic algorithm, made him attend a training on pediatric TB management, offered free gene expert tests for these patients. So this has been all to us told by a program manager, and this is how the standards of TB were also improve uh, in a way through the pharmacy-based surveillance. As a summary, it's possible to establish a pharmacy-based surveillance. We need to customize the model based on local context. Uh, this information we can use for identifying the right providers for engagement, strengthening the surveillance, and improving quality of TB care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rakesh. Um, interestingly enough, I actually had a first-hand experience in Kerala uh, a few months ago, where uh, I went to a pharmacy and I asked them if I asked them for TB drugs just to test the waters, right? And uh, the in Cochin, and um, the pharmacist told me, "Oh, I can't sell you TB drugs." And I said, "Why?" He's like, uh, "Firstly, I don't stock them anymore, okay? Um, and if you want TB drugs, go to the to the TB uh, hospital, and uh, they'll give you the drugs for free, madam." So, uh, so I uh, so I was actually curious at that point if you know limiting the sale of TB drugs. Um, I mean. It's the fact that he said they don't stock it anymore. Um, was that a conscious decision that, uh, you know, uh, the government did in terms of limiting the, the sale of those drugs in pharmacies or how did that work? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question area. So basically when we increase the regulation or regulatory offers as is, you know, what we have seen in other parts of the country also, they, they will refrain from stocking anti-TB drugs. That's, that's for sure that we have seen in many, many other parts of the country also. But here, uh, based, the, the government has done a purposeful decision uh, by engaging with all the chemist associations. And they have made a purposeful decision of stocking anti-tuberculosis drugs in particular points. They have mapped some chemist shops who are willing to keep the anti-TB drugs. And they ensured that in every taluk, there are at least two chemist shops who stock these anti-TB drugs also. So it, it is based on a decision by the drugs controller government and the chemist associations, where every geography, uh, there are at least two chemist shops who stock the anti-tuberculosis drugs, which is being aware, like this is being an initiative by the chemist association leaders themselves. So they said that we will stock the anti-tuberculosis drugs. These are the two chemist shops in this area stocking anti-tuberculosis drugs. Uh, they consider it as a part of their social responsibility also. They will also offer other services related to tuberculosis. As you rightly pointed out, like uh, that's a concern. The people, the chemist shops may withdraw stocking anti-tuberculosis drugs if we are enforcing too much on regulations. But Rakesh, I, I think you got cut. Uh, I don't, can't seem to hear you anymore. Um, so Rakesh, I think just looking at the time, we're already at four. 
Um, uh, so I, I think we really uh, need to stop. But I actually had a, a question, which I hope uh, if Petra, I had just a minute left and I just wanted to hear from Bolanle and uh, Kins on this, but in terms of incentives for, for pharmacies, right? Um, apart from cash incentives, are there other things that work? Uh, Bulanli and uh, Kins, if you could just give me a couple of lines on your thoughts on what other in incentives could work, that would be great. And then we could end this discussion. Uh, Bulanli, you wanna go first? Okay, um, yes. So performance-based incentives are critical to the engagement of um, um, retail drug stores from our experience. Um, it's a major motivation for them, um, especially the lower skilled PPMVs. Um, as a matter of fact, when you're transitioning between programs and incentives stop, you may actually notice a drop in TB notifications from this um, group of providers. However, for the pharmacist, the incentives will pay through the program um, are a bit too small for them. Um, they will want it to be higher, which sometimes we can't afford in the programs. And um, so we appeal more to their professional sense. And in that line, they want to be able to go beyond presumptive identification and referral to dispensing drugs for treatment support. That is why that is the next level for the TV program in Nigeria, um, being able to engage them in that line successfully. Thank you. Got it, got it. Thanks, thanks, Bulandi. And, and Kin, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, my Basically. thought on this is, uh, uh, in uh, in our experience in this pharmacies project, one of the most interesting finding was that uh, most of the cases were coming, uh, the most of the numbers were coming from the chain stores, like there are chain stores which are uh, old working from the 1900s, and uh, they were sort of supporting us, and in fact, they actually helped us uh, raise awareness as well, and they never charged us any kind of incentive. Even the inbuilt hundred rupee per per uh, new case uh, reported wasn't uh, wasn't sort of taken from us. They uh, they sort of thanked us for that. On the contrary, the small chemist shop they requested uh, sort of support with IT at certain levels, and they requested support for uh, the, this thing, the softwares, uh, the softwares if they can have an inbuilt software in which they can record and later notify the uh, the things to us. So th okay. that kind of support, I think they, that can work. And then uh, uh, certain pharmacies actually asked for that. We normally forget that we have to uh, report on the app. So can we have a couple of stickers st uh, with the with the process written uh, sort of st stick under the glass of uh, where we actually uh, develop our bills and everything. So this kind of things actually came from various anecdotal stories from real stuff. That's amazing. I mean, these small things really do add up and make a huge difference. And uh, I, I think this was a fascinating discussion. I'm so glad to be in the presence of such amazing people who are doing such great work on the ground. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I, one of the key learnings I got is I think we need to engage pharmacies, pharmacies, pharmacies and pharmacists uh, in a lot bigger way. Uh, one of the thoughts that just crossed my mind is I think they can play a huge role in contact testing as well. Um, and and put, I mean, of course, that that's just um, um, uh, you know a potential that's waiting to be unravelled. I think. Um, but thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Sorry, we just got a little over, uh, and uh, and I'm excited to uh, introduce you to our next um, the next part of uh, the workshop where we have uh, more, which is going to be moderated by Frank Wafula, who will be talking about messages to pharmacies pharmacists. Uh, Frank, over to you. Just going to jump in so that I, um, if you, thank you so much, Ria, for moderating this wonderful morning, this wonderful hour. And thank you to all the presenters for your amazing knowledge and uh, wonderful presentations. We're, we're going to make all the presentations available to everyone who is here. It will be on our website and we will send a follow up email. We're also recording. So anyone who wants to look back, thank you, presenters. Please stay on because we're not done. I, I know we didn't have a whole lot of time for discussion, which we planned, but that is what this next hour is about. 
Um, our next hour, we are going to look at some more practical hands-on uh, tools and messages for pharmacists. And we would like to also use this opportunity to break you out in a discussion group so that there is space for a smaller group to discuss and we'll have time to uh, discuss a larger group together. And that is going to be all guided by our wonderful next moderator, Frank Wafula. He's a senior lecturer at the um, uh, in health management at the Strathmore Business um, uh, University. And he has a wealth of information and uh, background in academia. He has a PhD, a Master's of Public Health and a pharmacy degree. So his knowledge is really exactly in the area where we are talking about today. He's also a health specialist at the World Bank Group supporting many several countries in Africa and has done a lot of research in health systems. Frank, I um, hope you're with us. Can you turn your camera on? Wonderful. I'm so glad to meet you and see you. And I'm really excited for you to uh, take, take the microphone from me and lead us through the next hour. Um, thank you for being with us, Frank. It's all yours. Uh, thank you. Can you hear that? Ah, all right. Yeah, so thank you very much, Petra. That's very kind of you. I really enjoyed the conversations as well. I just got the tail end of Bonlandi's uh, presentation, but I was there for Keynes and Rakesh. I think there's amazing work that's going on. Um, and I think it links very well to the next session that you're getting into, uh, which then um, 